Ted Crawford uh, is, I guess, first and foremost, our neighbor uh, within four miles of this place, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, but he grew up in the artist colony of Woodstock, New York. He majored in economics at Tufts University and graduated from Columbia Law School in 1971. He clerked on the New York State Court of Appeals, 72, 73, and he began practicing law with a law firm of the following year. And at the same, but his interest in writing led to also teaching writing at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Realizing his students lacked legal and business knowledge, Crawford developed a course entitled Law and the Visual Artist. This led to his first book, Legal Guide for the Visual Artist. I feel we should almost hold up every book, but in the, in the few minutes before we began, many of you came up saying, well, I have edition one or I have edition two, and it's now a, more, a sixth edition, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how did you come to teach, and then how did you come to write this book? So I had a friend, and he was offered an opportunity to teach writing at the School of Visual Arts, but he didn't want to. So he asked me if I'd like to, and I jumped at the opportunity and began teaching there in 1971. And once I was teaching writing, I began to teach literature. My father had been an English professor, and um, discovered that the students were going to become freelancers or run their own businesses as artists, but really didn't know anything about business or legal matters. So I suggested to the administration that they create a course called Law and the Visual Artist, and uh, they, did, they were enthusiastic about it, and that course began in 1975. And as I developed the curriculum, I realized that it would make a good book, and there was really almost nothing like that uh, at that time. So in 1978, um, Hawthorne Books published the first edition of Legal Guide for the Visual Artist. This edition is the sixth edition, and um, it's published by Allworth Press, which is the publishing company that I started uh, in 1989. So from teaching at the School of Visual Arts and writing the book, I became very involved with artists, artist rights, and artist organizations. And uh, I was on the board of the Foundation for the Community of Artists, which published Art Workers News. They had a strong point of view about artists being workers and should be treated properly. Uh, at one point, I was chairman of their board. And then um, when the new copyright law, and knew this is now 1976, uh, was going to come into effect, there was a provision about the compulsory licensing, that is the use without asking permission of artwork on public broadcasting stations. So I organized a coalition of the various artist groups, uh, the Graphic Artists Guild, Artist Equity, uh, the Society of Illustrators, the American Society of then Magazine, now Media Photographers, and there were, in the end, there were about 50 groups. And we began, first of all, negotiating with PBS about this provision, and also then lobbying about other aspects of the copyright law, uh, in particular, work for hire, which said that someone who is an employee or commissioned to do certain kinds of work uh, can be treated as an employee and therefore the copyright vests in the commissioning party, not in the artist. So we didn't think that that was right. We thought there should be safeguards for that. And the other, one of the other large issues was moral rights. This is the right of the artist to be acknowledged as the creator of their own work, uh, to not have the work be damaged and exhibited, to not have the work in certain cases be destroyed. And Senator Kennedy, uh, held, well, I should preface it by saying, so I interviewed two, two artists who had been involved in landmark moral rights cases, and they had both lost. Uh, one was Alfred Crimmy, who had done a mural for the Rutgers Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, and it had been painted over. Uh, the, the other was Alberto Vargas, who was an illustrator for Playboy, and basically, uh, <clears throat> 
the name on, on his illustrations was changed from Vargas Girls to uh, Esquire Girls uh, when he was working for Esquire magazine. And the two very interesting interviews with, with those gentlemen. Um, and when Senator Kennedy was going to have hearings on his moral rights proposal in Manhattan, uh, Al uh, Alfred Crimmy was invited to testify there. And I went with Alfred Crimmy and, um, and he testified about his experience. And ultimately, uh, Senator Kennedy's bill became law. Uh, that was in 1990. So as a, uh, in the meantime, I was both publishing and acting as general counsel for the Graphic Artists Guild uh, in the early 80s and then more as a lobbyist. So I testified in Washington uh, before the Senate Subcommittee on Court Civil Liberties and the Administration of Justice about both moral rights and work for hire. And we tried to get a sort of more favorable uh, rendition for artists. Um, at the same time, I became involved in publishing. I think I, by then I had written four or five books. I followed Legal Guide for the Visual Artist with the Writer's Legal Guide. And um, I, I was publishing the pictorial books of the art societies. Uh, this would be their annual show, or in some cases, advertising vehicles that the members placed ads in and were then given free to art buyers. So um, that was interesting, but I really wanted to publish books of the kind I had written that would be intended to help the artist community. And this would be uh, professionals across all disciplines from uh, visual arts to, to writing to music to theater um, to film. So uh, I founded All Worth Press in 1989 and uh, began my career as a publisher, but also as an author, because uh, Legal Guide for the Visual Artist was, had its second edition in 1985. In 1995, I wrote The Secret Life of Money, and then uh, that was followed in 2012 by a novel titled The Floating Life, and then another nautically themed novel on wine dark seas about our friend Odysseus and his ultimate return after 20 years of war and wandering to his home on Ithaca where his wife and son were waiting. So James, I think I've talked long enough. Well, <laughs> let's ask, you, you brought up questions that I at least want to know more about. Because I'm, there have been some famous cases, and in fact, maybe the most, uh, things we know about. For instance, the last scene of, um, uh, of a, of a movie called Cradle Will Rock is about Diego Rivera's mural in the Rockefeller Center being destroyed with jackhammers. Mm -hmm. I guess because it was owned by Rockefeller Center. So I think that that's also a famous case. Yeah. And that if you didn't have some special contract at the time that art was made, you had no rights to it whatsoever uh -huh. if you had sold the, all rights. There was no moral right, which was sort of, would be uh, preeminent and above the contract. Uh -huh. And Kennedy's law changed that. So, so now art of recognized stature has special protection that, in a sense, can go beyond whatever the con contractual arrangement may be. And it might not be possible to destroy that today. Would it be retroactive? For I, since I know there are Diego Rivera murals in the New School for Social Research. Well, it would, just it, on the wall of a classroom. Yeah, it would apply now <clears throat> to that artwork, mm -hmm. um, but it wouldn't be retroactive to something already destroyed. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I guess there's limits. And what is the hobby loss? A lot of people. Oh, I'm might surprised you that. want to know about that. <laughs> so um, sometimes artists go on for years and years and years pursuing art because they love it and they don't make a profit. And they may take their expenses and deduct them on their tax return. And at some point, the IRS may step in and say, well, you're, you're not trying to make money. You're just a hobbyist. You don't have a profit motive. Uh, and therefore, we're going to disallow all of your deductions that are in excess of income that you earn. And this was so in the mid-'70s, I wrote two papers on copyright for 
volunteer lawyers for the arts in New York City, and also a lengthy article on the Hobby Loss Challenge. And, and the sort of short version of it is that unless you're a wealthy person and, and you're spending your money on art supplies, you're going to be able to deduct those expenses because you must have a profit motive. You know, you don't have the wherewithal not to have a profit motive and pursue the art form. So uh, there were actually nine factors and by going through each factor, you could then argue based from the factors as to why it showed a profit motive and not a hobby motive. Um, so that was just interesting that um, it's sort of if you're, if you're willing to sacrifice for your art, the IRS could be a burden to you. <laughs> and that's not a good thing. I thought at the present time it was you can lose money for two years and deduct the losses, but not three. So, right, it used to be if you made a profit in two years out of five, there was a presumption that you had a profit motive. Now, you have to make money in three years out of five to be presumed to have a profit motive. But even if you lose money for 20 years, you can go in and prove by the nine factors that you have a profit motive. Huh. One of the factors being you're not rich, you can't afford to frivolously spend this money that's being deducted. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of eye-opening to me when I discovered this, and I had 91 footnotes in the article. It was <laughs> extensive research. Um, and one thing before we move on, what is the freelance isn't free law? Oh, so this is a very recent law that's been enacted in, in New York, and it, it basically, in New York City, and it's been proposed for New York State and passed by uh, the legislature, so the question is whether Gov Governor Hochul will sign it or not. Um, and it, it requires that when someone is going to do freelance work, they have to have um, certain contractual formalities. There has to be a written contract, it has to specify what rights they're giving up, what pay they're going to receive, when they'll be paid. So it's basically to protect freelancers, and particularly, of course, artists and writers. Oh, I, I should also mention something amusing, which is that um, sometime in the 1980s, uh, for the Foundation for the Community of Artists, we published a book called The Art Law Primer. And the, the author brought to my attention that another publisher then later brought out a book with the same title. And she, being a lawyer, wanted the foundation to sue them. So I, I called up the Lions Press and said, you know, we're you did this book with the same title, and we're going to sue you. Uh, and this led to my becoming friends with Nick Lyons. <laughs> and, um, and he then used Legal Guide for the, his wife was an artist, had a hobby loss problem. And he then used this book as a way of winning his case at the IRS. Oh. So it was um, kind of convoluted, but if you, we just said this is, we, we really don't want to be suing over a book title. And in any case, it has to be a series of books. One title is not protectable by copyright or trademark. Yeah. I thought titles were not copyrightable. And titles are not copyrightable, but if you have a single title and you want to trademark it, that's uh, also not protectable by trademark. Uh, you have to have a series title. So if the series title was Legal Guides for Artists, and this was book one and there were five other books, that would be protectable, uh, but not a single title. Ah. So the art law primer was not protectable. But I could threaten them anyway, and you can always be threatened by somebody. Kate has asked, how valuable is the US copyright outside the United States? So it has some value, but the, the maximum, uh, there are international treaties. So there's the, the Berne Copyright Convention, which we joined in the early 90s. Uh, there are several other copyright conventions. So it, it offers some protection. Um, and you might also then consider copywriting in individual countries if you wanted maximum protection. So because some countries are not parties to those conventions. We'll move on to the secret life of money. 
Now, I know there are lots of secret life <laughs> books of snails, of lots of other things, but um, in, in reading it, uh, I, I, I guess, speak of the island of Yap, because oh, that okay. is <laughs> the strangest one, where the money is heavy and it's carried around. Yeah. So actually, uh, money takes innumerable, f has taken in innumerable forms. It can be dog's teeth, it can be bird's feathers, um, it can be paper, like the paper we carry around. Um, and on the island of Yap, uh, the islanders would go on the Pacific uh, 400 miles to another island where they could quarry huge stones that might be 10 feet across in a circular shape with a hole in the center. And they would bring them back to the island of, of Yap on rafts, and then they would carry them on shoulder poles around the island till they put them wherever they were supposed to, whatever family owned them and had wealth because of them. So um, at some point, the Caroline Islands, which is where the, the Yap Island is, became owned by the Germans, and the Germans wanted the people to improve the paths on the island. Uh, so they told the islanders to improve the paths, and the islanders did nothing because they were happy the way the paths were. So the Germans had an ingenious idea. They had a man go around the island, and there were these huge uh, round stones in many places, and they just had the man paint a black cross on the stone. And then they said to the islanders, the black cross meant the stones were no longer money. And at that point, the islanders started improving the paths. And when they had done it to the German satisfaction, the Germans sent another man around the island. He removed the black crosses, and they said, the stones are money. And then the, the islanders celebrated. And there was one interesting story. It was about a huge and beautiful stone that was being brought back across the Pacific. And because of a storm, it was lost and went to the bottom of the ocean. But because people knew that it had gone to the bottom of the ocean through no fault of the family that owned it, it was felt that the family still owned it and that they were still wealthy because it was their stone. So it emphasizes the mental aspect of money. Money it requires our kind of mental ascent to what it is. And the book goes into why, why is this? What is it that makes us willing to give value to something that obviously doesn't have value? I mean, a dollar bill has no value. It's paper. It has the value that consensually we give it, it's fiat money, it's ba backed by the government. I have here, this is a, this is recycled US currency. There's more paper on this sheet than there is in a dollar bill. Why isn't this worth more than a dollar? Because nobody will accept it in commerce. And then if I were to go a little bit further, you may notice on your money, your paper money, it says Federal Reserve note. That means if you wanted to exchange it, you could go to the Mint and get another Federal Reserve note. But this was not always the case. Before 1965, the dollar bill said silver certificate. And if you took silver certificate paper money to the Mint, they would give you silver dust. And another thing that you probably haven't thought of too much is the size of our paper money today. Maybe it's about this big. In 1929, it was actually about that big. And they made it smaller so that they wouldn't spend so much on paper. So um, it's very interesting how the, the mind has an has a interplay with money. The, the earliest exchanges were really thanksgiving rituals for what the divine abundance was made available to, hu to humans and tribes would have these rituals and they would be thankful for the harvest or the, the, the fruit of the hunt. Uh, and they would try to 
please the, the divinities by, let's say, if, if they ate a fish, they would take the skeleton of the fish and put it back into the river so that it could be regrown uh, as, an, as a new fish that they could then have the cycle of fertility that allowed them to survive and also nature to be fruitful. Um, and this led on to um, uh, goddesses of fertility like Persephone and also uh, Persephone and also her mother Demeter uh, and Juno in the, the Roman panoply of gods and goddesses. And one of the aspects of Juno was the goddess Manita. And the goddess Manita was the goddess of a mint. And from that mint, money came forth. So it was a way for the fertility to express itself in in a circulatory form, if you have gone to the Temple of Delphi, uh, not in Greece, you'll see as you walk up the path to the temple that there are treasuries. And the treasuries, there are 20 treasuries belonging to the different city-states. And those treasuries held wealth. And those wealths could be, that wealth could be given as sacrifices to the gods. Um, but th because wealth was held in the treasuries, it also became possible to issue money from that wealth, whether it took the form of um, silver tetradrachmas or whether it took uh, ultimately the form of paper money. I mean, there, there were things like uh, white antelopes uh, that were used as money. And they tried to restrict inflation by controlling the size of the herds, and eventually there were no more white antelopes because they over-controlled uh, the fertility of, of the animals. So Monita, and in that name, there are uh, measurement, uh, mindfulness, warning, and I think those are all very relevant qualities to bring to money. And um, our, our mints today come from that temple. And you may notice that the bank architecture of the banks around 1900, even up to 1950, it was all like huge churches. They're glorious edifices. Then, in 1954, Manufacturers Hanover built a branch on Fifth Avenue between 43rd and 44th that had just plate glass windows. You could see right in. You could see the vault. You could see it was like the, the, the Holy of Holies was exposed. And that was the beginning of credit cards and fast food. So um, the whole attitude changed. And banks that had never looked at ordinary people as a source of profits began to look to the ordinary consumer as somebody who could borrow from them. They could make interest from these people. They could take deposits from them, and they could then, in a sense, arbitrage the deposits by getting more interest from other people than they paid to those people. Um, so it's just an interesting history. And the fact that our, the, the big debate towards the end of the 19th century was whether uh, money should be backed by gold only or gold and silver. And, and William Jennings Bryan spoke of being crucified on a cross of gold. I mean, it was very dramatic. Um, but by 1932, uh, there was ni neither gold nor silver was really backing our currency. And uh, as I mentioned in 1965, uh, that was when you could no longer go to the mint and even get silver. So it's interesting how swiftly it changes in a way, and yet we think it's all the same. Kate has Sorry. asked how crypto <laughs> fits into the scheme of things. Oh. So in, in the book, I mentioned that uh, the more digital things become, the harder it will be to see the value of what we're exchanging. Whereas the people who put the bones of the fish back in the river, you could see what was of value. You had eaten the flesh. You were putting the bones back so that it would be enfleshed again. 
uh, crypto lacks that. What crypto has is blockchain, and blockchain, of course, could be a very valuable thing, especially in the art world for NFTs. Um, so I think it could be valuable, but what we see with the conviction of uh, Sam ba Bankman-Fried is that you know you have to have honest exchanges. Uh, the, uh, part of the idea of crypto is you're going to escape from these these governments and you're going to have this sort of perfect universe, but you have unfortunately bad players that sneak in everywhere. <laughs> and uh, uh, the promise of, of, of crypto, I don't think has quite been realized. How, how did it come at the same time as we wrote, our founding fathers wrote, uh, there will be separation of church and state, uh, yet at the same time we have on all our currency and God we trust. Yes, so during the Civil War, a minister uh, approached President Lincoln and said, you know, if we were to vanish from the face of the earth, in centuries hence, men would not know we had been a Christian nation. So we should put on our, our coinage, uh, God, liberty, law. And um, that eventually got transformed into in God we trust. And that was then put on all the coins uh, that were minted not on the paper money. So um, it was, it was uh, later that it, it spread to the paper money and um, now it's on all coinage. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is an interesting thing because it, it also, in a way, has a kind of connection to the early love feasts, or that is the exchanges with, of thanks uh, for the abundance of nature. That is, in God we do trust, uh, to replenish what nourishes us. Feeling that I'm like a TV show, we hold up the next book that we will discuss. <laughs> um, this one, uh, well, why, why don't you tell that what the title means and what the overall story is? So, on wine dark seas, of course, is a phrase out of the Odyssey, and um, this is the story of what happened after the return of Odysseus to the island of Ithaca, uh, to his wife who had waited so long and suffered so much at the hands of the suitors and to his son who was coming to manhood and also didn't like having the suitors in his hall. It came from a dream that I had. Um, I was, uh, my father was wounded in the ankle and I, I picked him up and carried him down and as I carried him he became lighter and lighter and I carried him into a necropolis, a city of the dead and at the bottom, there was a hermaphroditic being that had a fountain, and I don't know if he drank from the fountain or not, but it got me thinking about father-son relationships, which is really what this book is about. <clears throat> Odysseus is the paradigm of the absent father. Um, when Telemachus was a baby, he left for the war. Now, he didn't want to go to the war. In fact, he tried to get out of it. But all, he had been one of the suitors of Helen, and all of the suitors of Helen swore a pact that if she was taken by anyone, they would all band together and go to bring her back. So this led to the Trojan War. And one of the interesting things about researching this was that I, I found that the Iliad and the Odyssey, which we may have some familiarity with from when we were in school, um, were actually only two of eight uh, epic poems in antiquity. The others have been lost and survive either in fragments or maybe in summaries. But the, the, the larger story begins with uh, Zeus and Thetis, the goddess, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Themis, the goddess of justice, talking about what they're kind of going to do to control overpopulation on the earth. And it's hard to quite understand because we don't have the full text, 
but it seems like part of it has to do with initiating the Trojan War, which they do by having at the marriage of Peleus, the father of Achilles, and Thetis, a sea nymph, someone throws an apple in it, into the marriage ceremony and it says, to the fairest. And then the three goddesses, uh, Hera, the, the, the mother goddess, Athena, the sort of goddess of wisdom and, and warfare, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love, um, disagree over who should get the apple, who is the fairest. And a child of Troy, Paris, whom his parents exposed when he was born because of a bad prophecy about what would happen if he grew to manhood, is chosen to be the judge on Mount Ida of which of these goddesses is indeed the fairest. And he chooses Aphrodite. So years later, I mean, the other two goddesses don't forgive him. <clears throat> and years later, when he goes to visit King Menelaus, who is married to Helen, in Greece, uh, Aphrodite allow, uh, um, enables him to steal her away and take her to Troy. And that's the beginning of, of the Trojan War. Then the pact that the suitors had sworn requires them to go to Troy. Odysseus feigns insanity, but a, a, a wily uh, Greek comrade takes his baby Telemachus and tosses the baby in front of his plow as he's plowing salt into his fields. And instead of just running the baby over, he stops. So he's sane. So he has to go. And that's the beginning of 10 years of war and 10 years of a miserable effort to get back home again. Um, but so, so in any event, so my book recounts a lot of what is not in the Iliad and Odyssey, but it also recounts the life of Odysseus, Telemachus, and Penelope on the island of Ithaca after his return, um, starting with the slaying of the suitors. So there was a lot of um, anger of the, the surviving families of the suitors against Odysseus and his son. And they had to, to live with that and deal with that. Is that the subject of the book? And it differs from so what we know of the 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 more traditional story? Well, it, it, it does and it doesn't. Um, there is one version of uh, one of the poems was the Telegony, and that told the story of a son of Odysseus by the nymph Circe, who comes to the island of Ithaca and kills his father unaware that Odysseus is indeed his father. But that story is very unlikely given that when Odysseus goes to the underworld in the Odyssey, the sage Tiresias tells him that he will live a long life on Ithaca and he will have a gentle death in a seaborne mist. So that was what I followed in my version. <laughs> and, um, and the telegony ends with, um, Telemachus marries Circe, who must be 30 years older than he is, he's about 17, and Telegonus marries Penelope, who was the wife of Odysseus. It just seemed bizarre, so it, it did not make sense, and I, I, I pursued what I thought was a more likely version. Kate has asked, uh, since this book is about a father-son relationship, and after researching it and writing it, do you have any other insert, insights about father-son relationships? <laughs> well, writing the book was a, a wonderful endeavor for me, and um, I felt in a way that the book was uh, channeled. That is, it came from me, but it, it kind of wrote itself to some degree. And um, part of that was the relationship of Odysseus and Telemachus. Um, so in that sense, yes, in the course of writing the book, I certainly meditated a lot as Odysseus went to his shrine looking out to the sea and meditated a great deal on his own life um, after his return. and after the slaying of the suitors, and after going to the mainland as Tiresias had required that he do to offer sacrifices to Poseidon, 
where men had never eaten salt nor seen the sea, and to carry an oar until he found someone who didn't recognize it as an oar, but thought it was a winnowing uh, fan for hard the harvest, and plant it there, uh, presumably on the mainland. So that is also recounted. Penelope is strongly against his leaving immediately to carry out that part of the vision of Tiresias, uh, and yet he goes. So uh, it's it just how the Trojan cycle, as it's called, kind of played through me and came back out in the form that, of what Odysseus and Telemachus and Penelope experienced in that part that we really don't know about. You're describing almost religious experiences. But well, it, I think it, that the books all have some spiritual basis, including even the legal guide for the visual artist, because I was trying to better the, better the condition of people who make art. And um, that was certainly, a, I thought it was a high goal. Um, on Wine Dark Seas is, uh, Odysseus, these are all um, reverent people. Athena is their, is their goddess, their, their uh, gu guiding spirit. And it is because of a eras when the Greeks sacked Troy that Athena turned away from the Greeks and they then suffered on their returns um, from Troy to their homelands. Yeah. And some of them never made it. Yeah. Or Odysseus took so many years. <laughs> um, to go from water to water, <laughs> um, a floating life is, uh, well, the, the title has many meanings. I, explain it, but it's, it's on water, in a sense. Yeah, so if on Wine Dark Seas is about the father-son relationship, a floating life is about the, the midlife crisis that some people experience, and in this case precipitated by a divorce. But it's told in, in sort of magical realism style so that there's a through line to the story of a, a man who is going through a divorce and learns of someone who could be his mentor and goes to meet the mentor who runs a very difficult to find shop where model boats are sold and that shop is called the Floating World and the man who runs and owns the shop is named Peshur and he takes the narrator in as his assistant and in the end after Peshur dies the assistant then has to go on a kind of quest to, to an island because uh, Peshur's dream is to tame the forces of nature so that whatever is destructive, those same forces can be used to eliminate the destructiveness. So if, for example, there was a tidal wave, that there would be a way to recirculate the water so that the water came back and met the tidal wave and held it away from the land. And he has these models that he has made uh, that are quite detailed and um, depict this sort of thing. So that's, that's one sequence uh, interspersed with this because the narrator is having unconscious, um, first of all, he's, he's uh, very uh, forgetful and um, he can't face certain things, so he has a lot of resistance. <clears throat> and he meets up with strange situations. So, for example, a dachshund comes onto his property and tells him that he brought the lawsuit against the narrator for the narrator's own good. Well, dachshund shouldn't speak and dachshund shouldn't trespass, so <laughs> nonetheless, the narrator is quite upset about there being a lawsuit and doesn't know what it's about. Uh, or in another segment uh, somewhat like that, a family of bears enter his locked apartment at night and tell him that they're going to eat him. And he suggests that he would prefer they not do that, um, but they eat him nonetheless. 
And so I just wanted to read you just briefly a little piece of that. I don't think of it as dying, the father bear said with an encouraging tone. Think of it as becoming one of us. Your flesh will nurture us. You'll become part of us. I don't want to be a bear. And we will become more human. And then it goes on. And finally, he um, uh, accepts that he's going to be eaten. Uh, he says, I was floating near the ceiling of my room, peaceful and untroubled by such fleeting thoughts as there could have been more to my life. I might have achieved more, or I might have been a better husband. If I could have done things like that, maybe I would have opened the fridge, poured tall glasses of golden beer, passed them from paw to paw, wrestled the bears to exhaustion, demanded back my keys, or even asked for their forgiveness for reasons I couldn't quite bring to mind. In any event, I was no longer worried about the body that once contained me, just thankful that it had served me well and for the extra roll of flesh around my middle that would help relieve their terrible hunger. I didn't understand the bears, but the beauty of it was that I no longer had to. <laughs> I think you've outlined a, a new business opportunity for, um, <laughs> what do you call it, funeral parlors. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I want to be involved in that business opportunity. <laughs> you've done something that, well, now anybody with an Amazon account can publish a book, but you started a traditional publishing house, did oh, you Oh, yeah, yes. Where people submit and you make decisions and then you agree to publish them. Um, right. Is that a sane decision? <laughs> so, so that was the decision that led me to write The Secret Life of Money. Um, I was thinking a lot about money as I started the publishing company, and at some point I started to think, what am I thinking about? Uh, and why am I thinking about money so much? Well, of course, there was very challenging. And um, that led to a very interesting sort of in-depth experience of money. And I guess the, if you wanted to say, what's the basic purpose of the secret life of money? It suggests that money can be, money, money circulates, currents uh, means flow. And money circulates, but it can circulate to a higher purpose. So that was the sort of, from the stress of trying to start a business, that was where the book took me. But yes, yeah, so I had been publishing with a partner uh, full color art books in the 1980s, but I wanted to publish books that would help creative people. And those would be textual books. And that was why I started Allworth Press in 1989. And I, at that time, knew many people who were interested in, in advancing the profession. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was how I found the authors and worked with many of the professional societies also. And, um, you know, they, they would have their own sort of guides for not just their members, but also the general public and publish some of those guides. And um, it, was, it was an interesting experience. This is a dangerous question to ask, uh, uh -oh. but do you, you've given it. Do you have any advice for authors in terms of their writing? Well, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think that there are several things. I did write briefly for the um, Slick magazines. I wrote for Glamour and Self and Harper's Bazaar. One of the articles was Women Who Do Sky Sports. But what I discovered was that I didn't like having other people edit my writing. <laughs> I mean, if someone wanted to edit it and have a back and forth communication about it, well, that's fine. But to simply change it and leave my name on it, I didn't feel good about that. So I very quickly became uh, disillusioned with the idea of publishing in magazines of that sort. And uh, I think and yet I don't want to say that people shouldn't do that. Um, I would say ideally, you, you know, you would follow your bliss, you'd, you'd do something that you love. And 
part of the reason for that is that today it's very difficult to get things out in the world. It's not like it used to be where you'd write a book, it would get reviews, and people would then know about it. Today you have to have a social media platform. And you can't really have a good social media platform unless you love what you're doing enough to do it on social media. And then the book, in a sense, comes after that. Um, which isn't to say that people without social media platforms can't publish books, but it's a very important aspect of it. So I, I would say to love what you do, to pursue it every day, um, to, to have a discipline about the pursuit of that, um, and to um, bring it to be what the, the best it possibly can be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I guess in the past, a publisher would hope that, uh, not a publisher, an author would hope if the publisher accepted the book, they would market it to their best book. Precisely. Thing. Is that the case anymore? I, I just don't think that it works like that anymore. Ah. So there are social media platforms that reach millions of people and the review sources have, have to a large degree vanished. So it's a, just a different landscape from it, what it was in 1990, for example, or before that. And I, I think that the author has to be kind of realistic about it. If you go to a publisher and you say, well, you know, I've got this number of followers and this and that, then that's impressive. Um, if you say this is the best book ever written, that's impressive <laughs> in a different way, but the, the publisher, unfortunately, is in a business and they're trying to think, can I, can I make a living doing this? Yeah, it has to. I feel very edified. <laughs> but at this point, we should perhaps officially ask if, and there is a hand up right there, ready already. Thank you, Mr. Sherbert. And thank you, Mr. Crawford. It's been very um, interesting and freeing, also stimulating. So, in terms of your first, the, the legal book for artists, um, I am both an artist and uh, a lawyer, and I have gotten questions many a time about, is this okay? If I do this, will it be okay? And I'm curious as to whether your response to people who may have asked me that question has been often or sometimes, it depends, <laughs> because, my frequent response is, it depends. And what that means is, you have to talk to somebody about the risk they are willing to bear. And I find it difficult to have nothing better than, it depends, um, to offer people. And I mean, recently there was a case, uh, it was the Andy Warhol case, and it is a, I don't have to tell you about what the case involved, but the transformative use of something is one aspect. Um, it, it is really difficult, not only to give others advice, when I had a show um, a few years ago, I bought the rights to an AP picture that I changed dramatically, but I did not want to have the slightest concern that what I did, which was inspired by this AP photo, might in fact come back to bite me. So I licensed it. Um, and then I know an artist who asked me about displaying some uh, drawings that were clearly drawn from photographs. And he said, what if there's no name on it? We just display it. And I, I guess I read a case and it seemed like the, the displaying of something is taking value from the person who originally produced the image from which it was drawn. So, anyway, it depends, <laughs> you know, what I gave, and I can't seem to do any better, so I wanted to ask you for your advice. So, you know, so I, I think the answer is you're right. I mean, you can't give a definitive answer to every question. Transformative use is a, it's a copyright issue, uh, in copyright law, there is something called fair use. Fair use says that you can take a small piece of something or a non-competitive use of something um, or a different purpose of something, um, and that might be a fair use. On the other hand, if you simply take the thing 
and profit from it as the original party who created it could have profited, then you're probably an infringer and you're going to be liable for damages. But the courts have created this doctrine called transformative use where something that obviously came from something else and is taking pretty much the whole of the other thing has been called a transformative use and that is considered a fair use. Now, you can't, uh, in the Warhol case that, that you referred to, um, the Warhol estate lost, but um, there have also been cases where taking like that, uh, the defendant won. So you can't really say more than it depends and, and outline the risks that attend uh, the advice that you're giving. Um, someone, I mean, there is a display right in copyright. So yes, uh, the owner of the copyright has the right to govern when the work is displayed. And just because the name, there's no name on it doesn't change that. Um, you don't know whether that might have even been registered for copyright. You don't need a name on something to register for copyright. So uh, it, it, there are many legal questions. This is why lawyers are in business, because <laughs> there are a lot of questions where you don't have a definitive answer. It isn't just yes or no. It's, um, well, it kind of depends on the circumstances and also what court you happen to end up in. And nobody should ever end up in court. That is a losing proposition before you even get there. So you have to err on the side of safety. Um, yes? I have to ask a question just to, as a follow-up to this. Sure. I have a friend now who's, who was also an illustrator, and now he's doing paintings, and they're very kind of unusual things, but he's using characters we know, uh, Popeye and Olive Oil, Mickey Mouse, uh, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, and uh, his wife makes Play-Doh sculptures of them, and he sets them in uh, landscape, so they look like monolithic, huge, gigantic things. But is and then he paints the heck. He's a very good painter. He paints the heck out of them. You can tell they're a Plato sculpture. Is that transformative enough to be fair use? Practically speaking, I think if if Disney wanted to sue him, he doesn't have enough money to defend himself. Well, I think that's a practical answer, but. You can see the, the problem. I mean, it doesn't sound to me like that's transformative enough, but I don't know. And, and unfortunately, you're not going to get an answer until you've engaged in litigation, and that would be very unfortunate for everybody. Yes? I work with the writer's group, and one, one of the questions that comes up from time to time is, if I were to publish, say, if I were to post some of my writing online, say in a blog post or on Twitter or Facebook, does that, is that then considered published? Does it mitigate my chances of marketing it with a traditional publisher afterwards? Uh, I don't, well, if you publish a little bit of something, um, or let's say that you're known in a certain area as an expert, so you continuously publish it, it might enhance your chances of getting published, uh, depending on the, the response to it and whether you have a following, basically. So I, I would not say that it would, if you publish, even if you published the whole book, even if you self-published an entire book, if the book did well, that might interest the traditional publisher in publishing it. Mm. Yeah. So I'm curious your views on AI's role in all this. Sure, uh, I mean, I have played a little bit with um, AI and I find it doesn't, they don't write well. <laughs> so it's a little bit hard for me to get to the stage of, of, of deep concern, but I gather that there is reason for concern. I don't think that there would be all of this effort being put into considering guidelines, particularly to protect against destructiveness on the part of AI systems, if there weren't a real risk. But as far, I mean, if you tell it to, you know, write, first of all, every poem they write rhymes. You can say, write me a poem that does not rhyme in the style of Ezra Pound about such and such, it will still be a rhyming poem, and it'll be sentimental besides. 
So the, the problem may be in the area of literature is that they're not human beings and therefore the nuances are kind of escaping them. But other things, if it's nonfiction, they, they can write coherently. There is a huge problem now uh, that there are AI-generated materials on Amazon, let's say, that are making it difficult to find the books written by people and that, um, in a sense, are presumably not as good as either. Um, so it, it is, it's, it's perilous, and both the Authors Guild and the Science Fiction Writers of America that I belong to are in, involved in trying to get some guidelines uh, on what uses can be made. Yeah. The, the visual books, you can tell, like, uh, you can say, I want a, a picture book like Michael Barber's style, that's so I am. And it could do a perfect mimicry of what I do. I've seen this, uh, other artists have done it to their the friends, have done it to them. And it's a perfect mimicry, and they don't need me anymore. <laughs> that, that, and, that's, and, it, and it would go to all my work that's out there, and that's certainly unfair. And, um, I don't know where we're going from here, but I've been in the business 50 years. This may be the end of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, one of, the, one of the protests of the Authors Guild is that these, insofar as the AI uh, uh, can learn, they're learning from material that was created by other people. And that's not fair. So let them learn some other way. But um, you know, there's a, a question, would that be copyright infringement or not? And, and there, if you know in publishing, there's one corporation that rules everything now, and their big thing is profit. So if they can save a lot of money by using AI, I don't put it past them. Yes. And as a follow-up to that, in terms of the ethics and the humanity of it, AI's algorithms are only as good as what has been put into it, and they do things that make basically white heterosexual males are the prototype and many people complained about what's generated. <laughs> it's not the whole panoply of human experience or imagination. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. Yes. Um, I know that at one time, at least in Artists Equity, there was an effort to get some kind of royalty rights for visual artists. What happened with that? So as far as I know, Artists Equity doesn't exist anymore. And um, in California, so, so, so in France, or in, in certain foreign countries, including France, there's something called the droit de suite, which is the follow right. And there, where an artwork is sold, a percentage goes back to the artist or the artist's estate. Uh, in the United States, California enacted an innovative law called the Resale Royalties Law, which provided for 5% of any resale to go back to the uh, artist. Uh, on, and the, the first trial of that case in the courts, they said that this was a, a, an innovative experiment of the type that the federal system encouraged and basically seemed to validate the law. But later, the, the law was struck down. Uh, and so that experiment uh, you know, has, has been basically vitiated. So the only way to create a resale royalty is right is by contract now. Uh, going back a long time, there was something called the Projansky contract, but it would simply be a clause in the contract that when the buyer resells, they have to pay a certain amount to the artist. And unless you've done it with a lawyer, I don't know if there's any way to enforce that. Well, I mean, you may have to get a lawyer to enforce anything, unfortunately. So, um, but certainly it's an idea that you could have in the contract, you would get the person to sign, then you could see whether they honor it or not. Let's go to the back. Oh, uh, this, this is a question about the secret life of Tag Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, you're saying you're an author, and I'm thinking that so you write every day, or, or you're in a regular way. So where does that take you? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's a very gratifying activity. Uh, it makes me feel that I'm bringing something out of myself that, to me at least, has value. And uh, it's interesting what makes us feel life is worth living, but for me that's certainly one of the things. Um, I like it more than paying the bills or other <laughs> chores that one might <laughs> embark on. Kate, did you have a... Yeah, this is a question I've been burning to ask. And that is, I know about copyright, and I'm a painter. So after I do a painting, I automatically have a copyright. In other words, I don't have to, I don't have to request it from anybody. But if I go to, if somebody infringes on it, when I go to court, if I don't have it registered, I'm in a different position legally for what kind of damages uh, I can, I can uh, get from that. Uh, but if you're a, 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 an author, uh, you could uh, register a book, and I think it's about $40. But if you're a painter and you do many, many paintings, you would have to pay $40 for each one to register it in order to prevail in court in a much better position than if you only had a copyright. So, um, you have to understand there are group 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 registration provisions. And you can photograph all of the artworks and register them as a group. And that way, for one fee, I think it's more than, it's done online now, so it goes, I think, from 45 to $125, depending on which form of registration you do. But that, in essence, shows that you create, you're the creator of it, you created it as of a certain date, you've registered it so you're eligible to sue, and uh, it, it's basically proof of your creation. Would the blockchain actually obviate that? I'm sorry? If, if you put it on the blockchain, would it make the registration uh, uh, not necessary because you have it on the blockchain? No, but the, the blockchain is not part of the federal copyright law. You would still have to register it for copyright and in order to be able to bring a lawsuit. Yeah. But the, blo the blockchain might be a very good thing yeah. for the provenance of artwork. Yeah. Thanks. I think we're going to bring this to a close. Thank you very much. James. And thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all. Um,